the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Linen wrappings, a face napkin, an empty tomb, and then Jesus in an appearance that one closest to him doesn't at first recognize him. All kinds of evidence floating around there of something going on and pointing to what? Something that we today still struggle in how we grasp. And we shouldn't be surprised that we get different accounts in different Gospels because different people are going to see whether the light is red or green if we put them on the witness stand. And if their testimony all agrees, we know it's rigged. But why is their testimony not in agreement beside the fact that we're dealing with different witnesses is that they're dealing with something overwhelming. They can report what they see. They can report what they perceived. Jesus comes back in a very real and corporeal manner in which he eats with them, he speaks. Later on, Thomas will put his hand in his side and feel the prints of the nails. Real evidence, but all of this evidence, while it points to who Jesus is and the fact that he's come back, it is all evidence of the fact that the resurrection has happened, not the resurrection itself. It points to the resurrection, but we have no witnesses sitting there saying, and here's how the linen wrappings came off him, and here's how the face covering came off him, and here's how he stood up, and here's how breath entered his lungs again, and blood, his body, and warmth came back, and he became animated and his eyes opened and all the terrible wounds that were put upon him as he was scourged and flogged, suddenly he looked better. We have no evidence of that. We have evidence of things that point to that, like the empty tomb, like the fact that they find the wrappings, like the fact that they're confused initially about who they're dealing with. Is it the gardener? We get a reality depicted to us, but the scandal of all this for most people is that Jesus rose from the dead. And I use the scandal in its original meaning, the word scandal. In its original meaning in Greek, it means something you stumble over. It's a stumbling block. This is where people stop sometimes. They say, Oh, Jesus is important. He's an important teacher, and he's given us wonderful moral principles, and we need to pay attention to him and try to follow him that way. But resurrection from the dead? I wasn't there. I didn't see it. You know, you hear things like that. Now, think for a minute, as an aside, really. If Jesus really rose from the dead, conquered death, is God then anything and everything he has to say and do is very important to us, and we should pay attention to it in the most minute detail. If he didn't, then what he said about himself would be evidence of him being a fraud or a lunatic, and why would we care what he had to say, even if we said it was good teaching? So that's why people stumble over the resurrection. It's because the resurrection matters and changes everything and isn't just some kind of metaphor. It changes reality, it changes creation. The literalists around us, outside the church and inside the church, like to treat a lot of this as metaphor. View Jesus as an important teacher. They want to be able to explain things in cause and effect reasoning with a testable hypothesis and a measurable outcome. You know, I didn't see it, so how can we prove it? How can we measure it? Otherwise, it's mythical. That's the way of the world around us. And it's a way that has come into large parts of the church as well. But we're proclaiming today the reality of what is most real and what is most real is not just measurable, except by its effect. Except, to take another example, by its absence. Look at the things that are most real and important in your life. Love, 
truth, beauty, good, being? You know when love is not there, but how do you prove what love is? You look at the effects of love, what you do because of love, what other people do. You know when truth is absent, when you're surrounded by lies. You know when beauty is absent, even if there are times when we're going to disagree about beauty. You know when good is absent and when evil is present. And being is that fundamental part of us, actually that image and likeness of God in which each one of us has been created. Being is what we cling to, the me inside, the important thing that we say, I cannot but be myself. If I discount myself, then all reality goes away. Now, in each one of those examples, one of the things we're doing is measuring effect. We can't do testable hypothesis and say, oh, here's the cause. But we can point to the effect and say, there is a cause there somewhere. And the problem we have is when we look at cause and effect reasoning and testable hypotheses, we're dealing with the natural world, right? You know, material stuff. And when we're talking about the resurrection and matters of faith, we're talking about things that are by definition supernatural. In other words, we can't measure them with material cause and effect rules. But that doesn't mean they're not real. So, for example, if you look at the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent putting together large nuclear particle accelerators so that scientists can try to find the Higgs boson, which they're calling the God particle, why? Because it's necessary to prove the standard model of cosmology. The way all these scientists look at the world and say, okay, under the general theory of relativity, this is how creation works. And for that to work, they have to have what? They have to have what's called dark matter in the standard model of cosmology. And they can say that dark matter is there because of how they can measure its effects on stuff that we can see and feel and measure and weigh and see how much light it puts off, all these things. So when we look at how galaxies and stars move and expand and relate to each other, we can measure the effect of all the rest of the stuff in the universe that by definition is dark because we can't see it or measure it or prove that it exists except by its effect. Except if you look at the standard measure of cosmology, the standard model, it requires that 84.5% of all of the stuff in the universe is this dark matter that we can't prove that it exists. But we can prove that it exists. And we have spent the better part of the 20th century and now into the 21st working on that because we say it has to exist because of all the effects we can measure on stuff that we can measure. You know, the planet Neptune was discovered that way. It was because astronomers were sitting there and they were tracking the orbit of the planet Uranus and they said, it's not moving the way it should. It's gotta be something else out there that's pulling it in a certain way, that unseen planet. They finally did the math and said, well, we have to look here. And they eventually, with the right telescope, found Neptune because of the effects that it had on something they could see already, which brings us right back to resurrection. Hard-nosed science relies on assumptions that something else is out there in measuring the effect it has on stuff that we can see. And in our lives, we can measure the effect of the supernatural on stuff that we can see and measure and experience ourselves. We can sit there and say, there's got to be some other planet out there. And there is. It's called God. It's called resurrection. It's called new life. Each one of us can be 
moved in such ways that other people see us pointing to the existence of someone else. We, in effect, can be Neptune. We can be the empty tomb. We can be the linen wrappings. We can be the shroud, which people sit there and say, how did that happen? Why is your life different? Why are you a person who can experience joy and new life even when the sky's falling around you? Why is it that you are a person who can not only believe in truth and speak the truth, but act like truth really matters when you're surrounded by lies? Why are you a person who clings to the good when there is every temptation to just cut a deal? Why? Are you a person who believes in love and knows that love is about the giving of self when there doesn't seem to be a worldly upside sometimes in how you give of yourself? Why are you a person who is drawn to beauty when you're often surrounded by ugliness and darkness? Why? Because there's another light there. There's another pole star that tugs at you with the gravity of resurrection. That pole star is Jesus Christ, the risen one. And he pulls you. Call the gravity waves, I don't know, call them the Holy Spirit if you want. Except we're not talking about metaphors and modes of action here. We're talking about God present with us. God as Father of all, God as Jesus who is beside us and with us when we gather in his name, God as the Holy Spirit who animates our hearts, lifts us up to prayer, that we can point to the reality of Jesus, we can point to the reality of resurrection, we can change the orbits of those around us that they too can feel that tug. This Easter season, all seasons, just as in our baptismal vows we say that we die with Christ, that we might rise with him, live into your identity as an empty tomb, an unseen planet, a linen wrapping. Change the orbit of somebody around you because of how you are an icon of the risen one. Thanks be to God.